Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this series on sampling in Max. So today we're going to move into Gen. We're basically going to take this principles from the patches that we made in MSP for sampling and just move kind of that same theory over into the Gen environment. If you're happy working in MSP and you're exploring that and having lots of fun with it, I would say stick with that. But if you want to get into Gen and you're excited by Gen, it is so fun, then come along for this journey. So what we'll do today is start with a, just a really quick recap of the patch that we built in the past, just to prime your brain a little bit, and then we'll get into kind of recreating it with some changes in Gen. So here's the patch from the sample switching video. If you want a more detailed walkthrough of this, watch the video, it's up above. But basically we have a bunch of samples that live inside of a poly buffer, which is over here, and we can switch between them. And then we have the object wave, which is this orange one here, which is responsible for doing the sample playback. And we basically send a message into that wave object that says, tells it which buffer we want it to read from. Any of these. And then we, using this ramp object and the rest of this patching, generate a ramp that goes between uh, between 0 and 1 or some values in between 0 and 1 to actually play back uh, that sample. And the way to think about the wave object is it treats the buffer as though the sound inside the buffer or the buffer itself is a strip of tape. And the signal that we send into the wave object moves basically the read head of the, uh, of the tape player along the tape. And so the wave object is kind of like this read head and you just send a signal in that says where that should be. You're just moving it all, uh, along, the, along the tape. And again, that is a value between zero and one. So we sort of take, no matter how long the buffer is, we just normalize that to the range of zero to one. So that's the basic design. Um, to change the playback speed, or the pitch actually, we change the playback speed. And we do that basically by modifying the length of the ramp that we want to create. So if we want to play at a lower pitch, we do a longer ramp with a shallower slope. If we want to do a higher pitch, then we use a steeper slope, which is going to give us a shorter ramp, a faster playback, and a higher pitch. OK, so with all that in mind, let's move over to Gen. I'm just going to close this, uh, and I will save it. And now we're over here in Gen. So the patch is actually over here, but we're going to rebuild it. And let's just get started. So Gen at title sampler. Okay. So the first inlet's going to take a click. The second inlet is going to take a MIDI note. And if we go in here, let's just start setting things up. So the first thing that we'll do is create a buffer that's going to hold our sample. And we need to give that a name and we'll call it sound. And the way that buffers work in Gen is basically if you want to be able to access a sound, if you want to be able to access a buffer, and by the way, you can use buffers actually for lots of things. In Gen, it can be very useful as just sort of a container for a bunch of numbers. In this particular case, though, we are using it to hold uh, audio. So what we'll do is we'll create that buffer, but there's actually nothing in this, and it actually doesn't even have a length um, because we didn't give it any arguments to tell it how many channels and how many samples long this buffer is. So it's it's just like zero amount of samples. It's just a buffer with nothing inside of it and no capacity. But what we can do is uh, kind of refer to this buffer uh, on the parent patch level. So the easiest way to do that is just to create a buffer of the same name. So if I create a buffer called sound and I put the uh, Cherokee.AIF sample in there, if I double click this, we can see that sound. If I close that and come back into Gen and then double click sound inside of Gen, I can see the same sample. So this is a reference to this same buffer. The other thing that we can do, which is quite cool, is refer this buffer that's inside of Gen to some other buffer that we have living in, in Max in the parent patch. So if I get rid of this buffer sound and I create one called, you know, my sound, and let's say I change the sample. So uh, Anton.AAF is another one that I know about that's built into Max. And you can see the waveform for that looks different. 
and then I send a message, um, sound my sound. So basically sound is the name of the buffer inside of gen. So we're going to say, what we're saying is refer that buffer sound to this other one called my sound. And now if I go back into gen and I double click, you can see, we can see that. So we can achieve that same thing uh, to allow, or we can use that same technique basically to allow Gen to access the samples that are living inside of our poly buffer. And in fact, I already have that set up here. So the, in this selected buffer sub patch, where we get a sample name in from the U menu here, I can just prepend that message with the word sound and send that into Gen. And now I can change sound and let's check and see cool so that's totally working great so now that we have our buffer uh, let's think about how we're actually going to play it back so there is a wave operator inside of gen uh, which again takes that value between zero and one and sometimes i will use this but in this case actually what i would i, I find is a little bit easier to do is to work with a an object that rather than taking that zero to one range, it takes the range of zero to the length of the buffer in samples. And there's actually a few objects that do this. One of them is called sample. I have a lot of trouble getting this one to work sometimes. I get weird aliasing or it doesn't play. And I don't, to be honest with you, know why. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But I found more reliably uh, that the peak uh, operator works quite well. So peak basically is a sample reader or a buffer reader and we'll give it its first argument is going to be the name of the buffer that we want to look up. And what this operator is expecting to receive to its first inlet is a sample index. So this buffer that has some sound in it is many thousands of samples long. And so if I send a value that's between zero and the length of that buffer and samples, it will give me the value at that particular position. The wave object in both gen and max, um, it has a, a feature, which is that it performs a linear interpolation. So when I actually send a ramp into this peak object, or I send a ramp into the wave object to play back a sample, the sample that's sitting inside the buffer is this discrete thing, right? We have, by which I mean, there are a certain number of slots, certain number of samples, and there's a specific value in each of those slots. However, the ramp that I generate will not always need, want a value that is exactly uh, an integer or exactly a rounded whole number. We might get a value like, you know, sample number 455.66 or something. So we need to be able to handle those situations by basically pretending that we have a smooth uh, signal, we have a smooth waveform um, sitting inside of the buffer. And there's many ways to kind of achieve this smoothing, but the simplest is linear interpolation, where if I send in a value of, let's say 0 0.5, what it's going to do is look inside the buffer and say, I know what the value is at the zeroth slot, so the, the very first sample. I know what the value is at the first slot, and I will draw a straight line between those two and I will take the midway point if the value is 0 0.5. If it's 0 0.3, I will take uh, you know, 0 0.3 of the way from the zeroth sample to the first sample. So that's linear interpolation. Peak won't do that by default. We need to tell it to do that. Wave will, sample actually will in gen, but again, I can't always get that to work. So what I always just do and have been doing is peak, refer to the to the buffer, and then use interp linear. If I don't do this and I play back the sample, what you're going to get is some harsh uh, aliasing noise. Okay, so the peak object is what we're going to use to play back the sound inside of this buffer. And like I said, it wants an index. So it wants some value between zero and uh, the length of the buffer. And just like in the MSP example, what we're going to do is create a ramp that goes into this peak object that sort of moves the, the read head along the sample. The only difference being that instead of using a value between 0 and 1, we'll use a value between 0 and the length of the buffer. So 
what that means is if we want to play back the sample at its um at its natural speed right at a speed of one then basically what we'll want to do is add for each uh sample in computer time right in the time of <laughs> you know of of our computer sample rate we'll just want to add one sample each time and just advance forward one sample for every sample that we have in real time so let's build that so i'm going to say we want to add the value of one each time and i'm going to use a clip object here and what we're basically doing is building an accumulator you may have seen other videos like the most recent one probably being that mark fell one where i made an accumulator in gen that basically takes a number and just adds the input to a kind of running total. So that's what we're doing here. The difference between this one and ones that I've done in the past is that instead of using a wrap here, we're going to use a clip. And I'll show you why in a second. So what we'll do is we have a clip and then we're going to pass the output of the clip into a history. And we also need to say what is the length of the ramp or what is the sort of highest value and the lowest value in the ramp by default it's just zero and zero so we will have no ramp but we want it to be zero to the length of the buffer so i'm going to take the second or the first outlet of the buffer operator here and just pass in the length of the buffer as the the upper bound of our clip another way that we can do this that's kind of a nice is with this operator called dim that is just specifically looking at that buffer object and getting the length. So we can do that. Okay, so now let me just pass to the uh, second outlet what we have here. And you'll see that what we get is just one, right? Because we're just passing a one in and passing it out. And we're clipping to the range of zero to the length of the buffer, but it doesn't matter because one is within that range. So we get it. This history operator is kind of magical. What it's going to allow us to do is take the output of the clip and loop it back around, feed it back into the input by introducing a single sample delay. So every time this gen patch runs, it's going to basically take what the clip uh, object most recently output and pass it around into the input and add one to that. So on the first frame, we'll get one. And in fact, you can see here it already, the number's already big and we'll, we'll explain that. But we'll get one, then we'll add one to one, so we'll get two, then we'll add one to two, so we'll get three, and so on and so forth. Okay, if I, um, if I restart this, like let's do like this, and you'll see, watch the number box over on the left. When I make this connection, you can see this number rises. So we have a ramp that goes from one to uh, the 124,439, which must be the length of this particular sample in samples. So we have now a ramp, and actually I can show you even more clearly that ramp by taking a scope here and going from zero to 125,000. And if I like delete and recreate, you can see that ramp here. So what we need to do, now we have this ramp, but we need to be able to actually restart it, right? We won't need to have it be so that when we send an impulse into this patch, that ramp gets re-triggered from zero to the length of the buffer. And the way that I'm doing it here is just by like deleting the patch cord so that now the signal value coming into the history object is zero and then reattaching it. Right, because now we're getting zero, so now it's zero being added to one, so we're getting one over here. But if I reconnect this, then we restart the accumulation. So what we need is some way to basically, like, with patching, rather than by just deleting a patch cord, get uh, kind of inject a zero in here. And a way that we can do that is with this object called switch. You can create it two ways. You can say switch, or you can use a question mark, which I think is really fun. And we'll send the output of the switch onto the history. What switch does is it takes something into its first inlet and it says, is that value zero or non-zero? If it's non-zero, it will pass through what it has received at its 
second inlet. If it's zero, it'll pass through it. It's received at its third inlet. So in the default state, we'll just use the false or the zero inlet. And then we'll take an impulse to the first inlet. So we're expecting that this input into the first inlet is going to be just a single sample that is non-zero, one really. And then it'll go back down to zero. And so that's going to have the effect of, for a single sample, just injecting a zero into this feedback loop when this value is one and restarting the accumulation. So let's test it. Great. So now when I send, when I click this case slider, I trigger a click, which is a single sample impulse I can show you. A single sample impulse at the value of one. Doesn't really matter if it's one or, you know, just something that isn't zero. You can see them. And that actually re-triggers the ramp. So that is brilliant. And we can now send that into the peak. And then we can send that to the output. And I will give ourselves, oh, we have a bipolar scope here. And if we bring our gain up, we're playing back that sample. Now let's do one that isn't drums or <laughs> basically atonal, hold on, also drums. Now you can hear that the pitch isn't changing, right? Because we haven't implemented the part where we actually changed the slope of the ramp, but we have done, you know, we have achieved playing back this sample. Now there's a few things that I wanna do sort of for hygiene's sake. So one is I'm just gonna add a DC block here to the output. All this does is filter out DC offsets meaning um, values that are not zero for a prolonged period of time is a way to think of it. Basically, all this is is a high pass filter at a really low frequency, like at a subsonic frequency. And the reason that that's necessary is like, if I were to send a value of like, I don't know, just any random value, like 300, 3000 into this, and I don't use the DC block, you can see that this value is negative 1.25763. And you can see on the uh, live gain here that we actually have some, you know, there's a signal here. If there's nothing happening and we're not actually, you know, trying to trigger this sound, we really want the value being output to be zero. And that's what DC block does for us. So it just gets rid of that, uh, what's called a DC offset. Another thing that's probably smart to do, although, you know, perhaps not strictly necessary, um, and we'll talk about why that keeps happening in a second. We'll fix that as well. But another thing that's nice to do is to make it so that at the first inlet, we kind of force things to be impulses or not, right? Because right now we could like send anything into this first inlet and it can create some unexpected results for us. So what I'm going to do basically is have uh, add a little bit of patching that really constrains the behavior of that first inlet to the case where we just get like some kind of impulse, meaning a value that is zero or a signal value that is zero that changes to something that is non-zero. And we'll consider that event where it goes from zero to non-zero to be kind of the trigger that restarts our ramp. So the minimum do this is first off, uh, use a Boolean, which basically just tests. I'm gonna turn this off for a second. Uh, it tests to see if the value of the incoming signal is zero or non-zero. If it's non-zero, we'll get a value of one. And then we'll use a change operator, which is all it does is tell us, uh, it reports basically the signal direction. Is the signal increasing, decreasing, or is it staying the same? If the signal is increasing, then we'll get a value of one. So that means that when we go from zero to one or zero to anything, we'll get zero, then one from the bool, then we'll get uh, zero and then one from the change object. And we then also need to just make sure we don't want to get anything from the change object when we go from one back down to zero because change is reporting the signal direction, right? So if you have an impulse that goes from zero to one and back down to zero, change is gonna give us zero, one, negative one. So we only wanna, we just wanna filter out that negative one and so we'll add a, 
comparator, we'll say if the value is greater than zero. And what that's going to do is basically turn anything that we might send in here, like say it's a gate that's longer than a single sample or some other weird signal, it kind of forces things to either be impulses or nothing. And we'll just make sure that still works. And our input in this case is, you know, it is an impulse, so it, it's all fine, but it's just nice to have this. Okay, so let's now think about um, how do we change the pitch of the of the sample by changing the playback. And the way that we do that basically is by changing this number, right? Because what we're doing here is essentially um, advancing one sample within the buffer for every sample of time within the gen patch. So if we wanted to create a faster ramp, then we would want to accumulate a value that's greater than one. If we wanted to create a slower ramp, in other words, a lower pitch, we would want to create, we'd want to accumulate a value that is uh, lower than one. So the way that we're going to do this is by basically converting our MIDI note value that we're getting here at the second inlet into some value that is between, uh, that is kind of above or below one, right? If it's closer to zero, we're going to play the ramp more slowly and we'll play at a lower pitch. If it's higher than one, then we're going to be playing that ramp more quickly and uh, we'll uh, play a higher pitch. So we're going to assume in this particular example that and again, I'm going to turn this off, and again, we'll fix that in a little bit, but for now. Um, we'll assume that the MIDI note value of 60 plays back the sample at its normal speed. So if I send in 60, I'm going to get 0. I'm then going to divide that by 12 so that we go from a, a kind of a, a semitone transposition relative to 60 to an octave transposition. And then I'm going to raise 2 to the power of that number. And if I pass that to the second outlet so that you can see it, if I send 60, then the value that I get is one. If I send 72, then the value that I get is two. If I send uh, 48, which is an octave down, then I get 0 0.5. So basically we are uh, changing the slope of the ramp or the amount that we accumulate based on this value. And so now we can basically replace this constant with that. Let's test. Cool. That's working. Um, there's one wrinkle here, which is this patch assumes that the sample rate of the file that we have uh, loaded into the buffer is the same as the sample rate of our computer, right? Right now, I think I'm at 44.1. Um, but if I were at 48 or 96, then the pitch that I play back this sample would change because the speed of time, I guess you could think of it, right? The speed at which samples flow by inside the max patch changes as we change the computer's sample rate. And if you have samples that are, perhaps you have very high quality samples that have been recorded at, you know, 96K, but maybe you're working at 44 or 48 or the other way around, maybe you're working at 96, but you have samples that were recorded at some lower sample rate, you need to make sure that the sample rate of the buffer is kind of adjusted, or rather you need to make sure that the playback is adjusted for that difference between your computer's sample rate and the sample rate of the sound in the buffer. So. Jen is not aware of this information. It does not know when we have a buffer what the sample rate of the buffer is because sample rate is really an attribute of the sample itself. And the way I believe that it is, is got is that when the sample is saved, um, whenever it was created, uh, that some metadata gets stored with the file. So whether it's a wave or an MP3 or whatever, there's some metadata that says, hey, the sample rate of this particular sample is 44,100 or whatever. So we can't get that information inside of Gen because Gen doesn't have access to that sample metadata. All it has is a buffer with a bunch of numbers in it. Um, Max, however, does have access to that information uh, through the info object. So what we're doing here, and I've actually already patched this, is we're just sending the name of the buffer 
into info and then we're banging it and its first outlet is producing for us the um the the uh the sample rate of the sample that is in that buffer um so what we'll do is just pass that into gen uh prepended by this message sample sr and we'll create a corresponding oops wrong place uh, we'll create a, a corresponding parameter called sample. Oops. Sample SR. Uh, that will allow us to receive that message. And I'll just set a default that's 44,100. So and by default, we're going to assume that that's the sample rate of the uh, file inside of the buffer. But if it isn't, then we can have that message. Sorry, I need to turn this down. Okay. Um, so then what we'll do with this information is we will divide that by our computer's sample rate. Because if you think about it, right, let's just assume the case where we want to play back the sample at its normal speed. If the sample rate of the file is 48K and the sample rate of the computer is 44100, then we're going to want to advance for each sample in computer time. We're going to want to advance a little bit more than one each time in sample time. So by taking the sample's sample rate over the computer's sample rate, or the you know audio settings sample rate, uh, then we can get to this adjustment that um, that adjusts this playback speed correctly. So all we need to do is take that and multiply it by uh, the output here. And in this particular case, I think that the samples and my computer are both running at 44. 0.1 K. So there's going to be no change, but um, like I said, if any of the, if either of those variables changes, then you'll get unpredictable results. So this is necessary. Let's test it. Okay. Let's now fix this thing where every time I change the patch, it triggers the ramp. And the reason for that is when I change the patch and it kind of recompiles the patch, uh, it forgets the value stored inside of this history operator, right? Which is kind of our ramp value. And it resets that back to zero. And so the accumulation is allowed to resume because the clip is no longer at its maximum anymore. So basically what we need to do is kind of suppress the triggering of the ramp when um, the, uh, when the, um, unless there's a, an impulse received at the first inlet. And a way that we can do that is by using a latch. So latch basically is like a sample and hold. The value that we send into the first inlet will be passed through to the outlet uh, when a sample or when it, a non-zero value is received at the right inlet, and it will hold the last value that it received. So whatever I have coming in here, when I send an impulse through, that value will start to come out. But until that happens, I'll just get zero. So when basically when the patch is loaded, when the gen patch is loaded, we're sending zero here, which I can show you right here, you can see. But then if I trigger the impulse, now we're getting uh, actually a value that is, oh, because I send mini note 59, right? We're getting a value that's lower than one because we want to play the pitch slightly low. Uh, this also has the useful side effect of making it so that if while the sample is playing, in other words, uh, after an impulse, the MIDI note value changes, then the pitch won't change uh, because we're only going to basically take in a new pitch value when there's a new impulse. So perhaps if you want the behavior of like, you can send lots of impulses in and the pitch is uh, decoupled from that, then you wouldn't want to do this. But if you're working with a kind of more traditional case where like I trigger a note and I can sort of think of that as being a note event that has a st please start playing now component and has a this is the pitch that I would like for you to please start playing now as kind of one message, then this is really the way that you want to do it. Um, the pitch can only be set basically at the time at which the impulse is received at the first inlet. Um, we can then send to the outlet our ramp, 
and we can feed this back around to that read head uh, send and receive. Ah, but we need to <laughs> we need to divide by the length of the buffer because this uh, slider over here that's representing our read head is expecting a value between zero and one. So we'll divide by a dim sound. Uh, you can also actually just take from the peak because it's going to report its position as well. Like it will give you what sample index it's on. Although I don't think that would be interpolated. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. There we go. So now we have our read head. Cool. So I think that's it for today. What we will talk about next time, I actually have noted here already, is the ability to change the start and end point. So right now, if I uh, if I do if I do this kind of stuff, uh, it doesn't change anything because we're not sending that information into Gen to say, hey, I actually want, only want you to play this little region. So we'll add that. Uh, we'll also add the ability to toggle between loop and one-shot modes. So right now, everything's one-shot, right? It just plays through the sample once, and then it's done, and we have to trigger it again in order to play it. But there's a way that we can set things up so that basically when that ramp completes, it gets re-triggered. Um, actually, we already did this. So those are the, yeah, those are the main two things we'll do next time. Um, and then after that is when things start to get really fun. So there's definitely a video that I want to do that's talking about how to make this whole thing a polyphonic with some techniques from Go that are really cool. Uh, we'll definitely do a video where we talk about envelopes because in our other examples, we actually have a separate amplitude envelope that we're just not using here. So we'll do a little bit of a explainer on how you can make envelopes. And that's one area I think in which Gen is really fun. You can kind of do what you want and craft envelopes that work really well for the types of sounds that you're triggering. Uh, and then perhaps the most cool thing is MC because Gen has the ability to um, be, you can, once you've saved a Gen patch, you can just make it MC, which is incredible. So I can say, you know, I have this sampler and I just want 12 of them. Boom, MC, and then uh, you can do weird stuff. Like I have an example uh, that I posted on Instagram recently, which will totally recreate where like the, um, the start point is getting randomized. And so as we play back some file, we get this kind of granular cloud type of effect uh, where we're playing back this sample many times but we're playing back different regions of it. Um, and, it and it sounds cool. Uh, yeah, so stay tuned for those. I'll be back soon with those. Uh, in the meantime, have fun with this. Let me know if you have any questions. If you're liking these videos, please like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Thanks.